All right, well, let's start by praying, and we'll get into this. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for your means of grace by which you show us Christ. And uh, we pray that you would, by the Holy Spirit, open up these truths to us, not only to our minds, but our hearts, that we would apply these things, being doers of the Word and not merely hearers of the Word. As we study this particular subject of the humanity of your Son, His human nature, and why that was necessary, um, Lord, keep us from vain speculations, but um, train our minds on those things which are profitable to us in your Word and um, help us to, to shun any error, even those that have been in our minds as we've... Uh, not study these things as deeply as we could, but help us to do that now. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So we're at uh, question 22 now, and uh, this is the second of the two that deal with the, the nature of Christ, but um, in this case, the two natures, and now we're, because both were dealt with last week, but question 22 hones in on the humanity of Christ, and that is this question, how did Christ being the Son of God, become man? And the answer is, Christ, the Son of God, became man by taking to himself a true body and a reasonable soul, being conceived by the power of the Holy Ghost in the womb of the Virgin Mary and born of her, yet without sin." So having established that Christ is true God and true man, we have to now focus more narrowly uh, on what it means for the Son of God to become man. And that's not just uh, the mechanics of it, so to speak, or trying to get more into the mystery than the Scriptures will allow, but is, is really, again, honing in on the whole idea of the necessity of this. There's this covenantal language um, but when the Reformed tradition uses that covenantal language, they're very much standing in the tradition of the early church fathers and, and their creeds. There's a, there's a little saying that half a dozen to a dozen of the early church fathers made famous, and they all say it in slightly different ways. But one way to say it is this, what Jesus did not assume, he could not redeem, uh, meaning what he didn't take on, he could not redeem. If he was redeeming human beings, then he had to become human nature. That's true positively of what we owe God in righteousness, and we'll see all that that means. But it's also true negatively in terms of what we owe him in terms of the punishment. On both sides of that, it had to be a man. And we could see that, but what this is forcing us to do is it's, it's getting specific about that being body and soul. And what is meant by soul? Why do they use this expression, reasonable soul or, or true body? Well, in the early church, one reason why they would say true body is that one of the heresies was uh, docetism. And docetism was like a, a subsection of Gnosticism. And we've mentioned that Gnosticism denied the goodness of creation. Well, if you believe that physical matter is evil, then how will you struggle with the incarnation, with Christ taking on a body? And so docetists, these were Gnostics, that, and, and the reason this word exists is because the, the Greek word dakane, which can mean to appear, it's one of the words that factors in with the word doctrine, but the idea here is that these people were saying that Christ only appeared to have a human body. And uh, this, was, this goes in a little bit into the Muslim view of Jesus. They would deny that he suffered. They have their own reasons for doing that, but the Docetists would deny that he could possibly have a body and still be good. It has to be like a phantom or, a, or something like that. Or maybe he's trapped in the body and he's liberating us all from the, from the physical. So they had to say this. They had to, but then reasonable soul, we might struggle with that too. So let's get to this and see... What's in view? And the outline today, um, very simply, by the way, I'm not going to have any pictures today. I will have um, a, a chart and comparing different heresies about 
the doctrine of Christ. But in terms of our regular points, I won't. I uh, just ran out of time with the conference and everything. But um, his nature, his conception, his sinlessness is the way I've broken down the parts of the answer. But let's look at his nature first. And those are the verses, quite a few in Hebrews, you'll notice. But it says that this, this, uh, this condescension of the word becoming flesh is, is something they call uh, this language of by taking to himself um, this human nature, by taking to himself. I think we should pause there at that language of uh, whenever you hear a theologian or a creed or confession using language like taking to himself or assuming, um, because what they're, a big part of what they're trying to do is get one notch more logically precise than just using the word becoming. Because when you hear the word became flesh, this is scripture talking, so it's not, you know, we don't need to be bashful about that. That's the Holy Spirit has inspired that understanding. However, like anything else in scripture, the sinful, erroneous mind that we have can misunderstand that. And the most obvious way to misunderstand that, uh, if you're thinking about the nature of God, is, well, how can God become it's actually one of my son's earliest uh, theological questions to me um, when he was six, and this was, um, and it didn't get much deeper than this. I mean, not that he, I mean, obviously he matured and everything, but I don't know where this came from. Um, I didn't know whether to be happy that I was training him right or be intimidated and run away. But he said, uh, out of nowhere, I don't remember how he said it. Um, well, if, if uh, God is is can't change, and uh, and and he became man. Well, then how does God not change? And, um, and I'm not much for saying, go ask your mother. But uh, <laughs> even somebody, you know, I study theology, I'm like, uh, and I know what I would say a grown-up answer to that. But it's a, it's a bit harder when you're explaining that to a child. But actually, a lot of the terminology that theologians come up with is, um, is very picturesque. Um, so these Latin expressions that, like, all of the change that's happening in the incarnation is what they'll call ad extra, to the outside of God. So they're getting you to picture, think a little bit, because that's all we can do. You know, there's no outside of God in the sense that there's a boundary, or to, we're not to think of this spatially, but the incarnation, just like creation, all of the change that is happening is happening in an effect of God, a creation. There's no change in God. We saw that last week, what happens to the Trinity during the incarnation. We saw why that's a misunderstanding. We looked at Philippians 2, I think, briefly about that word kenosis when, um, when Paul is saying that he, that he emptied himself, what that means and what that does not mean, that he veiled himself. It doesn't mean that any of his divine nature is somehow evaporated or goes away or there's only two left in the Trinity now during this time. And none of that's happening. This is all... Human nature, all of the changes happening in the effect of God, okay? So, you know, that obviously, that's going to open up a lot of more questions. That's, that's not going to do away with mystery, but it at least gives us a coherence of what we mean and what we don't mean. So that's why they're using language like taking to himself or assuming flesh. I mean, you know, what other words would you use? But uh, I think the, the, way they're, the reason they're using that language is because they want to say, okay, here's what we mean and don't mean by the word became flesh. We don't mean that the word changed. Okay, so I, I say all that to, to, to say what theologians are doing when they do that. But anyway, in keeping with the covenantal rationale for this section, the author of Hebrews is consulted here for a lot of different verses, but everything that's going on here is, is all about necessity. Studying his nature here in his humanity is all about what is necessary for salvation. So what specifically about Christ's humanity is necessary for salvation? We'll turn to Hebrews 2. They cite verses 14 and 16 in their proof text. I want to add 17 and 18. And, um, and maybe they wait when the question is his office of priest, and maybe that's why. Um, but it's important here, too, just because the... the What's going on here? Why did he have to become man? Well, the language of the author of Hebrews helps us. Hebrews 2, starting in verse 14, says, Since therefore the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise partook of the same 
things. I'll give you one reason right there. He, he's, he's adopting us since the children have this. Therefore, it's fitting that he has this. That's one reason right there. He himself likewise partook of the same things, that through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is, the devil. He skips to verse 16. For surely it is not the angels that he helps, but he helps the offspring of Abraham. Why bring in the angels there? He'd already done that in chapter 1. It's almost a different subject than what we're talking about, but there was a temptation to angel worship in various churches in the New Testament. And part of what the author of Hebrews is doing is that Christ is greater than the angels. And one of the things that's going on here is that he, he did not have an angelic nature in that sense. In other words, not disembodied or spiritual. He has a body. He, he's, this body, this nature, this soul is for helping those that are like him that have the same nature. It's not for helping the angels. That's another contrast. But if you look in verse 17 and 18, and this will come back, like I said, when we, when we talk about his office uh, as a priest, but listen to the ne- necessity language, necessity language. It says, therefore, he had to be made like his brothers in every respect so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God to make propitiation for the sins of of the people. For because he himself has suffered when tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. So another reason I don't want to wait just for when you're talking about the priest here, because that's what the author of Hebrews is talking about. In order to be a priest, he had to be made like a man. But you might still ask about that. Why? Just because they were men? Well, um, what does the priest do? He offers up the sacrifice. But as we'll see, and as the author of Hebrews says, he's not just the offerer of the sacrifice, he is the sacrifice. But unlike the animals, where chapter 10 tells us that the blood of bulls and goats cannot take away sins, he is the perfect sacrifice. And it was fitting because the sacrifice had to be a man anyway. Why? Because it was man that is guilty, and so man has to pay. But as Psalm 49, 7-9 tells us, nobody's life is is worth that, our, our lives. Um, the ransom of their life is costly and can never suffice. So it has to be a perfect man. And that's what that typology of the spotless lamb that's offered up. There's more going on there with the spotlessness of the offering. But that's one of the things that's going on there, that it has to be a perfect sacrifice to God. So it's not just that he had to be human to be a priest, but when you ask, well, why did he have to be human? One reason is he had to be, he he had to represent the people who are guilty in order to make this sacrifice. And that's not all. He suffered. And so he's he's able to help those who are tempted through things like suffering. And we'll see that in the Matthew passage uh, in just a second. But the point is the human nature of Christ is for our help. And specifically, it is a help out of the realm of death. And uh, we can add another passage later on in Hebrews, Hebrews 10, 5. And we'll, go, we'll come back to Hebrews 10, but just briefly, it says, Consequently, when Christ came into the world, he said, Sacrifices and offerings you have not desired, but a body have you prepared for me. So this brings us to the next words in our answer. Uh, to this question, by taking to himself a true body and reasonable soul. That's not just a neat thing about um, the nature of Christ that, that gets the heretics off our back. The true body and reasonable soul are things that we owed to God that we did not give to him what was his due. And there are things now, because of that, he owes us a punishment, and we can't Uh, pay that price. So let's address the more obvious part first, the body of Jesus. He says in Hebrews 10, 5, a body you have prepared for me. Notice the contrast between sacrifices you haven't haven't, uh, desired, but a body. How does his body contrast with those sacrifices? And by the way, God's the one that ordained the sacrifices. It's like Isaiah 1, when, you know, who asked 
you to get all this trampling of my court and so on. And you read Isaiah 1 and I, wait a minute, isn't God the one that ordained all these sacrifices? And the reason was they were being hypocritical and so forth. But again, if you look at the author of Hebrews, what he's telling us is that these animal sacrifices, even, even if the worshipers were genuine, even if they were not being hypocritical, the animal sacrifices still would not have been sufficient. So the contrast between the sacrifices that are insufficient and the body is that the body is being provided as a sufficient sacrifice. Okay, so that's only a man functions as this payment, and only a perfect man could be a perfect payment. Now, there's the less obvious reason for the body. The body is also related to a positive righteousness. Our bodies, God has given us bodies to glorify God. But of course, as sinners, we have not done that. And so there is also, in addition to his passive obedience by which he suffers in the body, there is his active obedience that requires a body. Uh, in order to obey the law in this world, in order to interact with people and love other people, which is very the heart of the law, he needs a body in this common field with other bodies. So the body is not just for a sacrifice and the penalty for sin. The body is for obedience, that he, he did everything he did in the body as our substitute in our place. And so God accepts his obedience in the place of us. But then there's that other expression, the reasonable soul. Uh, Matthew 26, 38 is given here, and I'm going to read verse 39 as well because of the will aspect, but uh, this is why uh, the Westminster Divines include this one. It says, then he said to them, this is Jesus speaking to the disciples in the Garden of Gethsemane, my soul is very sorrowful, even to death. Remain here and watch with me. You notice he says, my soul. He has this distinct soul from simply the divine spirit and the triune God. And that, of course, includes his divine nature as the eternal son of God. Now, why do I say that's distinct? Um, I'll, let's see, where am I going to turn to the heresies? I guess I don't get, to, oh, I do. I, I go right to that. So let me just go right to that now. Oh, yes. Um, there was a week where we did the Trinity, and um, that was one of the weeks that, the, that, the, that this didn't work. And this was one of the charts I had. So these are the big heresies that were Trinitarian heresies. And you can tell right away that a lot of it, they're Christological heresies too, that, that the Son was below the Father, created in time and so forth, or adoptionism that he simply became What's, oh yeah, the J is representing Jesus, and so those arrows represent that at a certain point, whether it's the baptism or whatever, whatever else, where he says, today, um, um, today I have begotten you. Different adoptionists would use different texts for that, but the point is that at a certain point in time, he becomes the son, that he wasn't the son before that. Well, that's a heresy too. That was week six. This is the one that concerns us here. Um, the bigger Christological heresies are on the bottom, and that would come in the century after Nicaea. The Nestorian heresy we talked about last week, but now I have a picture, divides the divine and the human, but it's not just a logical distinction. It was so pressed that they became, became two persons. That's what that wall represents. That's the best I could do. And then mono. Physitism or Eutychianism, because Eutychus was the one that really pressed this, is that the divine and the human came together, at this amalgamation, into one nature, mono, one, physis, nature. And that is also a heresy. These are two distinct natures. We don't tend to, maybe, these are not um, as familiar to us, because they're, they're, they're taking a more narrow slice but Apollinarianism was named after Apollinarius, who was in every other respect orthodox. He was taking the side of Athanasius and others at Nicaea. However, he committed, and sometimes this is called the God in the bod heresy, meaning that it's almost like Docetism. It's very much motivated by Gnostic roots. The idea here is that you still have to have 
the spiritual qualities that have to be divine. But sure, he has a body. So I'm not a docetist. I'm not a Gnostic. He has a real human nature. But what they're saying is that the eternal logos, the mind, that that is the divine mind in the body of Jesus, and therefore he doesn't have a human mind. That's what they're saying. And what this verse is saying is that he has a soul, and there are passages that we briefly mentioned last week, like Matthew 24, 36, of that day or hour. No one knows, only the Father. But he says, not even the Son And the basic answer that has been given throughout church history is not that Jesus was accommodating to his disciples and just kind of need-to-know basis kind of thing, but he he really did know. No, he was speaking about his human nature, as opposed to John 5.20, where he says that the Father shows him everything that he's doing. So you have to make a distinction like that, and there's all sorts of ways to show that Jesus had a real human mind. Over here... Monothelitism, thelema is the Greek word for will, and this is just doing the same thing with the divine will, because he has to be one will with God, but again, that erodes that distinction between the human nature and the divine nature. And you might think to this, who cares? But just like the body, again, what Jesus does not assume, what Jesus does not take on, he cannot redeem. If he did not stand in our place, not only bodily, it's not just our bodies that we owe to God. We owe all of our thoughts to God. We owe all of our feelings to God. We owe all of our decisions to God. And so it is very important that Jesus had a human mind, human feelings. Jesus wept. That means he really wept. And a human will. And so here's the very next verse in Matthew 26. And going a little farther... He fell on his face and prayed, saying, My father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. Now, what's going on there? Because surely he doesn't mean that only the father had this idea of redemption and him going to the cross. The son had other ideas, but that the son was submitting himself to the Father. No, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit always had this idea, this plan of redemption. So this is the human will of Christ submitting to God on our behalf. Why do we need that? Do we submit our wills to God? No. And we deserve God's curse and God's wrath for the failure of our will. But Jesus submitted his will in our place. If he submitted his divine will in our place, that's not in our place. He's submitting his human will and obeying God. So that's what's going on there in that passage, and that's why it matters. Because as Jonathan Edwards said one time, and I'm sort of paraphrasing here, there's there's nothing in the life of Jesus that is not propitious for us or toward us. No, I should be for us that he's, he's doing all these things in our place. None of this is just, well, that's neat, and that's the right orthodox idea, so I'll go with that because I don't want to be a heretic. I don't want to be an Apollinarian. Um, well, that's good, but, but we also want to recognize that when we fail to think as we ought to. So, for example, as you come to communion today and you think about sins that you committed and you know that you've repented, but you didn't really mean it. Sure, I meant it. Okay, did you mean it perfectly? Did you mean it to the standard of God's righteousness that he requires? It'll never happen. So what hope do you have to come to the table? This right here. Jesus obeyed for you. Jesus felt for you. I never feel it enough. Jesus felt in your place. I never think the right... Jesus thought the right thoughts in your place. And so on and so on and so on with everything that is uh, truly human. So again, what our Redeemer would redeem... He must take on himself. This is true of the body. This is true of everything that is the soul. Uh, Let me read that whole passage now from Hebrews 10. Now I'll look at verses 7 through 10, which it expands on this idea and that Old Testament passage that he's quoting um, about his desire about sacrifices. He, He brings that in again, and he clarifies. So this is Hebrews 10, verses 7 through 10. Then I said... 
Behold, I have come to do your will, O God, as it is written of me in the scroll of the book. When he said above, you have neither desired, you have neither desired nor take pleasure in sacrifices and offerings and burnt offerings and sin offerings. These are offered according to the law. Then he added, Behold, I have come to do your will. He does away with the first in order to establish the second. And by that will, we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. So you see that by that will that obeys in our place. There's a lot of stuff going on there about the old covenant versus the new, but the reason I'm bringing in that verse is again to show how not just his body, but that, that reasonable soul is, um, that's a gospel truth. It's not just an orthodox truth, which it is, but it's a gospel truth. I, I think I, I know I have the slides out of order, so um, bear with me here. Um, let me fast forward. This is where the, nope. No, you know what? Maybe I didn't have them out of order. Maybe it was my brain that was out of order. Okay. So we're going to ignore that because there is a, there is a bobbing quote, but this is a small one. Um, he, he talks about Christ assuming not only a true but a complete human nature. And that's very, very interesting as well because Christ doesn't just um, obey where Adam failed to obey and, and give us a reset, but Christ actually um, was fully human for us in a way that no other human being ever was, even Adam. So we talked about that, how Christ is the image of the creator that we're being conformed into his image. But think about this for a second. And this is really what Bavink was getting at. Um, orthodoxy, all orthodox Christian faith speaks of Christ being fully human, and he is. But here's a thought. I did this one time. Uh, this was a sermon in Mark 1 on I think, the baptism of Jesus. Yeah, that's what I called it. I called it the first man of the new race. And I started to explore this idea of Jesus identifying with us but actually being the perfect human. And just considering the question, because um, we so often think about, did Jesus really become like, did Jesus really become fully human? We never stop to ask the question, are we fully human? Is Jesus not the first fully perfect man? And if you put it like that, you're like, okay, yes. Yes, he is. And so part of human nature here is the full totality of what human beings are supposed to be. So you have to take that into consideration when you're looking at Christ's humanity, which I know is hard to do because we, the, the focus tends to be what he was uh, for us. But you know, when you start to look at the, the glorified Christ, which we'll get to, um, you can start maybe asking some of those other questions. Well, let's back up a step in the human nature to the, the, the more earthy questions, I guess you could say, that people uh, tend to ask I say earthy, but this is really more of a supernatural thing and um, a lot of blank space here. First of all, how would you even diagram this anyway? Um, so I'm fine with there being no pictures this week. Um, his conception, you know, um, we know from this passage, famous passage, Christmas passage, that we're dealing with a, with a miracle here, that it's supernatural. Uh, but even here, what I want to suggest is that there's necessity for salvation going on. So here's what Luke 1.34 and 35 says, And Mary said to the angel, How will this be since I am a virgin? And the angel answered her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. Notice that language, therefore, because the Holy Spirit, therefore, he will be called Holy. So once you grant the divine cause there, the Holy Spirit being the cause, there's still another human nature that I think for a lot of people is a stumbling block, and that is the human nature of Jesus' mother. In the womb of the Virgin Mary, the answer goes on to say. So not just being conceived by the power of the Holy Ghost, but in the womb of the Virgin Mary. And um, there's a couple reasons why that might be a stumbling block in the history of theology and in church history. And one of them has to do with this idea of the, the Theotokos, the, the God-bearer. And in fact, it was in the Nestorians that used that phrase a lot, that he was, sorry, that she, Mary, was the bearer of God. 
Um, we talked last week about the communicatio idiomatum, and hopefully we won't, we won't bring that back out until we get to the Lord's Supper. But the idea there, again, was that it is proper, it's doable, you can do this, um, predicate something to Jesus or the Son of God that is true of one of his natures. And you can predicate that of the person so long as you do not confuse one nature with the other. And we use the example of Acts chapter 20 where we looked at the blood of God. And of course, the divine nature doesn't have blood, and yet Paul used that expression. We can see what he means. And that's an example of, this, of using this idea of the communicatio eiomatum. Well, much more controversially, especially for Protestants, is this idea of Mary bearing God. Well, if I say Mary uh, bore the God-man, then you're like, okay, that's a little bit better. I feel a little bit better about that. Um, and what's the reason? Well, obviously Roman Catholicism and what it does to Mary, exalting her to some divine status. If I say that Mary is the mother of God, what, what, what's in your mind? You have this, uh, well, the mother comes before the son in any human relationship. Therefore, you're saying that um, you know, you're back to Arianism on top of it, in addition to exalting her to, to godhood. Well, of course, that's not what you know, Catholics used to mean. Um, when I say the Catholic Church here, I mean in the lowercase c sense. Um, these doctrines of Mary were not official until much, much later in the 19th century. Okay, But at any rate, um, can you say that, that, um, that Mary bore um, God? I would just say, uh, if you don't mean it in exactly this sense, um, don't bother saying it. <laughs> That's one way I've always resolved that. First of all, it doesn't really come up in everyday, you know, for everyday Christians, unless you're having some kind of debate with Roman Catholics. But you should know that if you are debating with Roman Catholics or talking to them, so that you, um, so that you don't have to sound foolish um, when they come out with this distinction. But at any rate, um, that's not the real reason that it's a stumbling block for a lot of people. For a lot of people, the reason that Mary's human nature is a stumbling block has to do with what that implies about Jesus. Because what we're driving at here is Jesus' fittingness or his capacity or his ability to save us. And of course, we understand that that means that he cannot be a sinner, that he cannot have a sin nature. Um, But going one more, sorry, one more thing about the miracle of the incarnation um, for those who have a problem with it. Uh, Bavink says this. Again, small words. Sorry about that, but I'll read it. He says, those who consider the incarnation impossible must, on further reflection, also at some point deny creation. Those who accept the latter creation have fundamentally lost the right to combat the former. We must add that if God was able to create and could reveal himself to beings essentially different from him, then he must also be able to become human. For while the incarnation is certainly different from all other revelation, it is also akin to it. It is its climax, crown, and completion. That really was out of order now that I think about it, because I was trying to transition to the sinlessness of Jesus. But anyway, that's one more thing to think about the incarnation. When you hear uh, objections to the miracle, my resp- that, that response is basically doing the same thing that I always do with like Jonah and the whale or, or anything else like that. Um, I, I, I'm not saying the person's a closet atheist, but they are at least um, being inconsistent in their belief in supernaturalism. Uh, and on a common sense level, I want to ask people that stumble over the incarnation, the virgin birth, or something like Jonah, I want to ask them, do you believe God created everything out of nothing? Oh, sure, yeah. Okay, so what, what is your problem then? <laughs> That's what I want to say to the person at that moment. So you, so you have no problem affirming that God created everything out of nothing, but you have a, pro- you have a problem with a, a, a whale. Um, you have a problem with a virgin birth. That's like a, a, a flicking of dust on the board compared to creating the whole thing. So I'm not... Like, where's the disconnect? 
And I think sometimes it's just they're, they're just parroting words of impressive people in the modern world that they've heard. I don't think it's really thought through at all. But where's this all driving? It's to his sinlessness. Um, if you go back to the problem of Jesus being carried in Mary's womb, it's also wrongly assumed that this somehow contaminates his human nature. Um, so our answer follows through with these uh, two propositions in one. Born of her, yet without Sin. I suppose maybe the Westminster Divines are thinking about that being a very common sense objection. Well, how can, how can he... So we don't believe in the Immaculate Conception, which also was an official doctrine at that time, and doesn't solve anything anyway, because then you have to ask, what about Mary's mother? You know. Um, but leaving that aside, on a common sense level, you may struggle with that. Well, how, how does that not contaminate him? Um, as if the issue is like physical space. I mean, if you have a problem with um, Jesus being born the normal way and that affecting him or polluting him or something like that, my question is, why would you not have the same problem with him eating with tax collectors and sinners? Well, five feet distance, then, you know, what is this? I mean, that, that's, that's really what you're doing is, is you're, you're confusing spatial nearness or something with the essence of sin. Um, but, of course, what really, on a more sophisticated level, this comes down to is the transmission of sin. Um, how, is, how does it pass down? That's another reason I brought up the whole creationism and traducianism thing. Um, because one of the advantages of creationism is exactly at this point. And that is that if God is creating each soul each time, well, then this is already not a problem because that's not the way that sin is passed down. I actually don't think you have to resort to that anyway, because the whole point is that this is a miracle. And you say, well, I know that. It gets rid of the chromosomes on, on, on Joseph's side, but, it, but it, doesn't, it doesn't do that to Mary's side. But again, I think you're assuming that the essence of the sin that's passed down is something genetic. Um, and beyond that, there's nothing stopping God. And of course, the scriptures don't explain the mechanism anyway. But there's nothing stopping God from creating the chromosomes on Mary's side, uh, just as much ex nihilo uh, in the sense of sinless. So in other words, it could be from her human nature without that being a sinful nature. It doesn't depend on Mary, I guess is really what I'm trying to say here. It doesn't depend on Mary or her line or anything else. Okay, and I realize that the virgin birth is a, is a convergence of several different things. It's a sign to us. He's got to be the son of David. But then you've got the sinlessness issue. And I think sometimes I think we mix it all in a pot as if they're all the same thing. And that's, um, that's not something that Scripture really allows us to do. That's speculation on our part. Um, all right. So fast forwarding here, um, what's the upshot? Was he made this way? And the answer is yes, he is made as perfectly, in this sense, as Adam was at the original creation. He's created without the stain of Adam's original sin and without that original guilt. He didn't have any of that. Again, because Adam's sin and our sin implies a double disease, Christ brings a double cure here. We not only need forgiveness of all of our sins, we need a positive righteousness before God. So a couple of verses to consider, and I don't have these ones up there, is uh, the classic um, imputed righteousness passages. Christ became uh, righteousness to us, 1 Corinthians 1.30. And you think also of Galatians 4, 4 and 5 which was one of the proof texts, um, Romans 5, 18 and 19, and then 2 Corinthians 5, 21. But these verses are brought in because here you have the sense of Christ in our place as a human being, but without sin. Okay, so for example, Hebrews uh, 4, 15. This is going to take care of this verse. is going to take care of the subjective side of it. For example, when we ask questions like, does God understand? Does God know what it's like? to be one of us. And of course, we want him to do that in ways that are improper, his divine nature or something like that. Okay, But it is through Jesus and his humanity that we do see that. And you see that in Hebrews 4.15. It says, For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. So you notice that? 
So in every respect, he was like us. And what he wants to draw out is, I especially want to talk about temptation right now because that's your problem. Not only suffering, but temptation to sin. Jesus withstood that. Jesus withstood and resisted temptation in our place. But it, it, again, it highlights the subjective part of his sinlessness, that this was not, um, you know, we're not to think of this, this is, oh, this was easy for him uh, because he's divine. Well, he had a power that we, that we, and that's a good thing, by the way, that he had access to the Holy Spirit and so forth. But his nature that withstood it was his human nature. And then objectively, there's a few places that show us uh, that he was perfect in our place. So Hebrews 7.26 says, For it is indeed fitting that we should have such a high priest, holy, innocent, unstained, separated from sinners, and exalted above the heavens. Here's another verse, 1 Peter 2.22. He committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. And then one of those verses I just looked at with imputed righteousness, we could tend to overlook in 2 Corinthians 5.21 that Paul uses this expression about his sinlessness. He uses the words that he knew no sin. So that's another verse that teaches the sinlessness of Jesus is 2 Corinthians 5.21. He who knew no sin. It's not talking about him not knowing about sin. It's, it's not about intellectual apprehension. It's a way of saying that he is sinless. And then finally, 1 John 3, 5, it says, You know that he appeared in order to take away sins, and in him there is no sin. So those are just a couple of passages that speak about the sinlessness of Jesus. And just remember, that's not just about his passive obedience, that he had to be spotless to be the sacrifice. It's also about his active obedience, that he had to obey the law in our place as well. That's what we're getting through faith, we're getting not only the, the clear record that he's forgiven us of our sins, we are getting his positive righteousness that we need to stand before God. Um, so all this stuff about his human nature is in our place for salvation. So let me open it up to questions or comments. Yep. So if we were to take a DNA sample of the, the incarnate Jesus... What would it look like relative to Mary mm -hmm. and Joseph? Yeah. Well, it wouldn't be Joseph unless you're unless there's stuff from uh, before in the line, because of course they're both descended from David. So I'm not a. Now I can say this now because of the Supreme Court hearings. I am not a biologist. <laughs> so. Uh... <laughs> So <laughs> I don't, but it would have uh, the, uh, and, that, and let's say it did, speculating here, let's say it was completely normal otherwise on, on Mary's side. Um, again, sin is not passed down that way, so we can, it would not have any, so could there be rewiring by God? I mean, come on, we genetically engineer. Certainly, God can genetically engineer. That's probably a better analogy than the one I was probably going to use for. Um, but um, yeah, they're, they're, uh, it would be a perfect uh, genetic information. <laughs> That's all I'll say. If you look at a, a human, what constitutes a human? It's a body yeah. and a uh, soul. Mm -hmm. And that incorporates mind and all these other aspects. Right. It's, it's really those two kind of aspects of humans. Yeah. So if you look at Jesus compared with the human, mm -hmm. he had a body, he had a soul. Right. But he also had the spirit. Mm -hmm. But in that sense, he would have the Holy Spirit in this sense, in the same way that uh, Christians do, more powerfully um, for his service. Yeah. Those that are born again. Yeah. Yeah, so his, so his human nature would have that. So that's what I'm talking about right now. Is his human nature would have the Holy Spirit um, in general in the same way that Christians um, do. Now, I'm saying in general because he has, you know, um, uh, the Spirit without measure in the, in the sense that is necessary for the incarnation. So I'm not suggesting anything like uh, miracles. Obviously, he did miracles by the power of the Holy Spirit. And there's that whole debate about is there anything he, um, that he did out of his own divine nature? 
Um, and R.C. Sproul really hammers this home that it's um, that because he is doing those things in our place, therefore those things are done by the power of the Holy Spirit, um, not his divine nature. He could have in the incarnation, but God saw that it was fitting that as a human he would stand in our place. Um, that raises questions, though. I can, I can see how he's obeying. I can see how he's resisting the devil under the power of the Holy Spirit, and why I need that because he's doing that as a man in my place. What I can't see as well is when he's walking on the water. I don't need to walk on the water. Um, but I don't know. Um, I don't know if we have to say that about everything he did. Um, but, um, but there wouldn't be anything wrong with it. There'd be nothing inconsistent with saying that the Holy Spirit empowered him to do every single miracle. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh. If, he, if he was the perfect human being, which is what we, I believe, and that's right. what you said earlier, I, I understand that. What about disease and aging of that body? Yeah, I've gotten that before, and I've gotten, since he was even crucified, does that not suggest that, he, able to be killed at all, doesn't that, some people will say, doesn't that suggest that he, how could he if, if he didn't have the sin nature? And one of the answers is, um, and it's not the main theological answer, but it's just one of the things I like to say to people, just to stretch their brain a little bit, is, well, if animals are sacrificed, did animals sin? No, but they're subject to the curse. So I'm just kind of stretching their brain a little bit to say, you can't argue from the fact that he was killed to the fact that, um, and I don't think the person's saying he deserved it. I think what they're trying to say is, because he's subject to death at all, well, he shouldn't be. He should just be a superhuman or something. And I think that's a, a, a huge leap in logic on their part. Now, aging and things like that, it's, I, it, it's almost a little bit like some of the Adam questions in the garden. Um, he, it wasn't designed to be the case. It was, he was designed to go to the cross. He was designed to uh, be glorified after the resurrection. So um, I can say, no, uh, God would have. But then, you know, the whole point is that the incarnation is, is designed to go exactly as it did. So... Um, Right, in that sense that he grew. So that raises the question, what is the ideal age? What was Adam and Eve? How old would we be in heaven? Yeah, uh, how old would we be in heaven? Um, or you know, how old were Adam and Eve in the garden? Um, the consensus is that they were at the peak of their abilities, body and soul, and so the same would be... Um, it would be fitting that Jesus was, was taken, uh, the, the, the crucifixion and everything, that that was at the, the prime of his life. Um, but it'd be speculative to say more than that, I think. Yeah. Um, yeah you had a question? Well, I just, <clears throat> the walking on the water and all his miracles were faith. Mm -hmm. Even Peter had a measure of it until he doubted. Yeah. And he started to sink. But um, that's, that has something we can do. Yeah, there is a, there's a right way to think about this and a wrong way to think about it. The wrong way to think about it is like a, the word of faith movement, um, where Jesus is an example for us in that he was believing God. For Part of the problem there is that they want us to have faith for things that God does not promise us, things in this world. They have other problems, but that's one of their problems. Um, but can we speak about Jesus having uh, faith? Uh, there's a... Um, one of the professors I had at RTS, his doctoral thesis, and it's still a published book, was um, the faith of um, Christ's, the Christ's faith. Maybe that was the title of it. Um, there's a sense in which Jesus was entrusting himself, Peter says, to the one who judges justly. So is, does Jesus have a kind of trust and faith? Yes, in his human nature, not for the same ultimate things that we need faith for, like salvation, because he didn't need to be saved. Um, so it's one of those things that we have to be very careful to define our terms when we talk about it, because there are millions of people in our country at our time that are part of this word of faith movement um, that's affected so many churches that when they think of faith, um, and, and for example, Peter exemplifying the same act, walking on the water that Jesus did, it's, um, it's a very touchy thing because people have so bad ideas about that. Um, I can think of non-word of faith teachers that have given bad sermons on um, what it means for Peter to have gone out on the water and uh, Jesus to be walking on the water. So it's true, there's a kind of faith that Jesus had in his human nature. But he would tell people to, yeah. oh ye 
a little faith. Yeah. Yeah, to believe in God and to believe in God's power, um, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Faith is a gift. Yes. It is definitely a gift for, uh, yeah. We are saved by grace through faith. Through faith. So Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 and Philippians one twenty nine and other places talk about it being a, a gift of God. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Um, any other Questions? Yep. I always have. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, going back to your other two charts, oh, yeah. uh, we have a former famous monophysite, and that's Augustine. He believed in that and left it becoming a Christian. Mm -hmm. And then your next backslide, if you go back one more. Oh. Uh, They're going to be back. Yeah, go back one more. <laughs> <laughs> your Arians are your Jehovah's Witnesses. Yeah. And your modalist is T.D. Jakes. Yeah, among oh, others, yeah. He's among the most famous. Yeah, so it might be good if you can put examples yeah. by those so that people know today what to look for. Yeah, oneness Pentecostals. Yeah. I'm not saying all Pentecostals, I'm saying oneness Pentecostals. Although, with any of these, most evangelicals believe in some form of one or more of these. They just do. Um, it's bad out there. <laughs> and, um, you know, I, and, in, in our own Christian lives, we mature in our faith and we look at some of these things. We look back and realize, oh, I was, a, I was an adoptionist. I was a modalist. You know, for my first two years as a believer, or my first 20 years as a believer, until I read such and such. Um, yeah, this is deep stuff. And, um, you know, that's why James 3 1 is in the Bible. Teachers are judged by a stricter standard. Yep. Real quick, on modalism, the M stands for? What did I do? Oh, no. Oh, I know what happened. It was originally right. Sorry about that. That's to be an S. Um, this morning, I was pasting that one into this doc, and I got the two mixed up. So yeah, that, that should be an S. Thank you. Um, for people out there, that should be an S under modalism and the one in the middle. That's, that's a rare find that I, I usually just make the mistake and have to regret it afterwards. Yeah, that should be an S. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, let me pray. Our Father, we thank you for this time together to study, to look at the human nature of your Son and how that stood in our place, how he assumed to himself all that we mean by flesh, that is body and soul, that we owed to you, that we could not repay once we have sinned. And so, Lord, we thank you that your Son has taken on flesh and that he has done so in our place for our salvation. We thank you for all this in Jesus' name. Amen.